this unsuspecting city, history's greatest experiment creates tomorrow's greatest superhero, Spider-Man the Movie. A live-action spectacular directed by Joe Zito, based on the characters created by Stan Lee. I need to apologize. Spider-Man's film history stretches back a lot further than you probably think, and no, I'm not just talking about the 70s Spider-Man as portrayed by Nicholas Hammond, or the Japanese Spider-Man, the Emissary of Hell. I'm talking about the Spider-Man films of a bygone era that never made it past production. And you know, let's keep recent events in mind. Remember when there was the whole thing about Sony and Marvel trying to make a deal as to who gets to make Spider-Man films? Let's wind the clocks back. We're having this discussion even in the 19th 70s. Not with Sony Pictures, but with a lot of other companies. So in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about their stamp on Spider-Man, what we might have seen had events played out a little bit differently in the past. So sit back, relax, subscribe, we're in for some unseen Spider-Man movies. The story begins in 1976 with Steve Krantz. Steve Krantz was pretty familiar with Marvel comic adaptations. As the producer of such cartoons as The Mighty Thor, The Marvel Superheroes, and the original 1967 Spider-Man TV series. And it wasn't just TV cartoons he did either, he even did the two feature film adaptations of Fritz the Cat. Steve Krantz is the very first producer to try and take Spider-Man and put him on the big screen. And as far as he was concerned, he was gonna do it in style. Because his his first vision for Spider-Man was a very glitzy affair. Imagine a Spider-Man film, but with show tunes and dance numbers. But I mean, obviously that wasn't something that was going to work, so he did adjust his idea into something more familiar. It was going to be an adaptation of The Night Gwen Stacy Died, which is a peculiar place to begin your Spider-Man screen adventures, that's for sure. But some changes were made. No, not to make it work as a first installment, but to just add a lot of robo-Nazis. It just wouldn't be Spider-Man without an army of robo-Nazis. Well, Steve Krantz's idea for Spider-Man, his vision was not entirely left in the dust. As in 1977, Spider-Man would make his live-action debut in a TV movie, which began the familiar Spider-Man 1970s TV series. Steve Krantz was not involved, for better or for worse, and thus the legend of 1970s live-action Spider-Man was born, without a single show tune, dance number, or robo-Nazi. My only reasoning for wanting to see something like this would just be straight up curiosity, to be honest. I mean, to be honest, Steve Krantz's ideas for Spider-Man are no more out of place than Julie Taymor's with Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark's first installment. But it's not something where if I had a time machine, I'd go back in time and make sure this happens because, well, it doesn't really sound good enough to justify that. It could have prevented some of Spidey's existing on-screen history if it sucked, which it inevitably would. And if I had a time machine, why would I go back and do this? I got flying cars to see, come on now. But obviously, 1977 Spider-Man was not the end of Spidey's live-action adventures. As in 1982, Spider-Man swung right into the grasp of Roger Corman, who's known for producing pretty, uh, well, kind of trashy cinema at the time. He's a busy guy, in fact, he still produces films today, such as Dino Shark, Dino Croc vs. Super Gator, Sharktopus, Death Race 2, well, it goes on. He's gotten about a bit with the schlock genre, put it that way. The thing is, Corman must have had some degree of respect for the character of Spider-Man when he enlisted Stan Lee as the screenwriter. Now, before you all cheer and applaud and say that this is the Spider-Man movie you've been waiting for, Calm down a second. Stan Lee was an author of comic books. And an author of good comic books doesn't necessarily equal an author of a good screenplay. I mean, I don't know, maybe Stan Lee would have pulled a rabbit out of a hat. The fact is, for the first time in Spidey's live action timeline, we had a Spider-Man film that kind of properly understood what makes Spidey Spidey. You had your radioactive spider, your Uncle Ben's death, Doc Ock, Mary Jane, all things that we for some reason hadn't seen before in a live action Spider-Man film. And if you want to get really nostalgic about Spidey lore, remember that time he intervened in US foreign policy to stop the war with Russia? Wait, what? Well, that was gonna happen in this movie, I guess. Yay! Some downfall came, though, when Roger Corman and Stan Lee 
both couldn't see eye to eye on what their Spider-Man film would be. Stan Lee wanted a big budget blockbuster full of action spectacle and thrills, as he would. I mean, he's Stan Lee, that's what he's all about. But Roger Corman had a different sort of budget in mind. He wanted, um, well, for kind of the right ballpark, just gonna check my bank account and my savings. Yeah, around 62 pence. Good old Roger Corman. So yeah, naturally the whole thing collapsed. But don't feel too bad for Roger Corman. He got his chance to deal with Marvel characters in 1994 with the Fantastic Four, which was never released. Man, this guy must have felt some heartache in his time. But don't worry, it wasn't over for Spider-Man, as Marvel had one last ditch effort in mind. In 1985, the rights to Spider-Man went to Canon Films who would go on to produce such classics as Superman IV The Quest for Peace and Masters of the Universe. The thing is, this Spidey deal was a bargain for Canon Films, who agreed to pay Marvel Comics $225,000 for the rights to Spider-Man, with a strict five-year deadline in place to produce the film. If the film was not released by April 1990, the rights would then revert back to Marvel. But let's put this into perspective a little bit. This deal came about in 1985. Fox's deal with the X-Men came about in 1990. So that's a five-year gap between Spidey's rights being sold to Golan and Globus at Canon and the X-Men's rights being sold to 20th Century Fox. How much did Canon pay for Spider-Man? $225,000. How much did 20th Century Fox pay for the X-Men? $2.6 million. Canon Films had a bargain. Now there was of course the matter of shared revenue as well, but I'm not gonna go into that because, well, we don't have any numbers for that. So naturally Canon got to work doing all the important stuff you gotta do for a movie in its early production stages, such as releasing a magazine all about Spider-Man and making a short trailer for it, I guess. Within this unsuspecting city, History's greatest experiment creates tomorrow's greatest superhero, Spider-Man, the movie. A live-action spectacular directed by Joe Zito, based on the characters created by Stan Lee. It's all about the marketing. This is kind of what Canon Films did. They tried to sell the movie to theaters and audiences before the film was made. Thanks a bunch, Canon. Now, Spidey going to Canon was considered a last resort. Don Kopolov worked as Marvel's film agent in the 1980s, and he stated that he never would have gone to Canon as a first choice. Now, there were some younger studios and younger filmmakers that all wanted to get their try at making Spider-Man, but Marvel opted for experience this time. And let there be a lesson to all of you, employees, Employers, CEOs, whatever. Experience doesn't always necessarily mean better. More often than not, it means less forward thinking. And that's what Canon films were all about. Making that sail, making that dough, that moolah. So we do have a few details as to what this film would have been. Golden and Globus wanted an experienced director attached to the Spider-Man project, so they wanted Tobe Hooper, the director of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Who looks at the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and thinks, yeah, that's the guy for Spider-Man? I mean, to be honest, that same question applies to Sam Raimi. I mean, who looked at the Evil Dead and thought, yeah, that guy should direct a Spider-Man movie? But I mean, it worked out in the end, so maybe this would have worked out. Well, how about that cast? Tom Cruise was eyed to play Spider-Man. And at that time, Tom Cruise was quite a young actor. Gonna give my own personal two cents here and say I'm not a fan of Tom Cruise. I find his performance is pretty bland and he seems like an oddly malicious person in real life. But I'm not gonna go into detail about that now. All I'm saying for now is I'm glad we didn't get Tom Cruise as Spider-Man. And they also had quite a big get with Lauren Bacall as their version of Aunt May. Now, we we don't really know any details of what this portrayal would have been like, as today we have zero clue of what Aunt May's role in this film was. And like with Roger Corman's Spider-Man ideas, Doc Ock was supposed to be the main villain, as portrayed by Bob Hoskins. And you know, I think that's quite an inspired casting choice. So the casting of this was kind of hit and miss. But then we get into the nitty gritty details of what this film would have been. So Golan and Globus, as the producers of this film, had zero clue as to what the hell a Spider-Man actually is. But like, you know, he's a Spider-Man, so it must be just like the Wolfman, except he's a spider, right? So they hired Leslie Stevens, known for The Outer Limits, to write the script. And it was a Spider-Man origin story like no other. So this version of the story takes place on a remote island and focuses on a mad scientist named Dr. Zork, 
who went out of his way to expose the company's ID photographer Peter Parker to radiation. Ha, huh, so Peter's a photographer in this universe. What a coincidence, considering they clearly didn't do their research. The result of this radiation turned Peter Parker into the eight-legged Spider-Man. A combination of spider and human, spider and human, and a combination that I call Spooman. Now, Dr. Zork was already working on an army of mutant monsters in this version of the script, and Spider-Man would have to battle them one by one, rebelling against his creator, Dr. Zork. So they presented this and a number of other concepts to Stan Lee. Now, if I was Stan Lee, I probably would have just packed my bags and said, you know what? Get some help, you absolute yo-yos. But instead, Stan Lee set about making his own guidelines for what this film needed to be, which would then be turned into a script. Heck, Stan Lee even wrote himself into the story in the cameo to end all cameos, because in this case, it wasn't the cameo. It was a full-on role. Stan Lee would be playing J. Jonah Jameson, which is... Pretty appropriate, I guess, because he did always base J. Jonah Jameson off of himself. So who better to portray the role? Well, obviously J.K. Simmons, but still, like, this was nice. And so the first proper script actually got made, as written by John Brancato and Ted Newsom. And then the script was rewritten again by Barney Cohen, with the finishing touches added by acclaimed writer Joseph Goldman. We all know good old beloved Joe Goldman, right? Also known as Menahem Golan in disguise. <laughs> he added his own script changes under a pseudonym so we wouldn't know it's him. You sure bamboozled us good this time, Golan. But the result actually ended up being pretty similar to one of the best Spider-Man and superhero movies ever made. The plot focused on Otto Octavius being Spidey's college mentor. The difference was that Spidey and Oc would be created all at once in a cyclotron accident that would turn Doc Ock into Dr. Octopus and Peter Parker into Spider-Man all at once. No radioactive spider bite there. But the plot would revolve around Doc Ock trying to rebuild his project and get it right this time, despite the fact that it looked like it could potentially destroy all of New York City, and Spider-Man would have to go stop him. But guys, Goal and Globus weren't just setting out to make Spider-Man 2, they, they had some other plans of their own. They started off with the most pointless renaming ever by renaming Dr. Octopus to Professor Octopus, who referred to his mechanical arms as Waldos. What, can he, can he not find them? Thank you, I'm here all week. It gets better though. Barney Cohen added a little something to this script. He added a sidekick for Doc Ock called Wiener. Yep, his name is Wiener. And Wiener even had his own catchphrase. Okie dokie. The hell was this whole thing? Was it like a Animaniacs episode or something? What's with the naming? Dr. Zork, Wiener, the Waldos. Actually, that sounds like a band name, Dr. Zork, Wiener, and the Waldos. If anybody wants to use that, you can use it for free, but please credit me, okay? And rather than Mary Jane as Spidey's love interest, we instead had Liz Allen. So everybody got to work. They began location scouting in Italy and England. For some reason. I tell you what though, there's a lot of weird echoes to the present day in this. Doc Ock trying to rebuild a device that could destroy the city, Liz Allen being the love interest, locations in England and Italy. It's like all the best Spider-Man movies rolled up into one terrible movie. Now of course there were massive budget cuts as at this time Canon Films was suffering major financial losses. So 20 million dollars became 10 million dollars and they needed a new Spider-Man. Somebody more affordable so they found a stuntman called Scott Scott Lever, who could both do the stunt work for Spidey and do all the major acting. Now, Scott Lever had already done a lot of promo events as Spider-Man, but after this, the director left, and Canon Films kind of became very busy with making Superman for the Quest for Peace and Masters of the Universe. In 1988, they did start up production on Spider-Man once again, this time turning to Albert Pyun to direct. Albert Pyun is now known for the 1990s Captain America, and say about that what you will. So Don Michael Paul and Ethan Wiley were brought on board to write a more horror-inspired version of Spider-Man. Instead of Doc Ock, Spidey would now be taking on a scientist who turned himself into a vampire but also isn't Morbius. But the director wasn't really happy with this decision, he wanted the lizard as the villain. A villain that they just couldn't get to work on the budget that they had, what with costumes and special effects required. And then the director got 
busy with Masters of the Universe 2 and wanted to shoot that at the same time as Spider-Man and use different sets between the two of them and share out the sets. And then the failure of Superman 4 started to really put an extra weight on the studio until finally all of this strain on Canon Films led to a corporate takeover by Path. But this wouldn't be the end for Canon Spider-Man. While Globus chose to stay with Path, Golan instead negotiated his own severance deal which gave him the rights to Spider-Man and Captain America, which led to the 1990s Captain America film and Golan drafted in James Cameron to write and direct the Spider-Man movie, which I will talk about in a later video. What do you guys think? Would you have liked to have seen these films? Comment below and discuss, and as always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, don't forget to hit subscribe, hit the like button, and in the description below are links to my Patreon and my Discord.